Okay, so let's begin the presentation now. One of the things that, that's interesting about this uh, version is when I took a look at the presentation that I did about a year ago for FlyQ EFB 4.5, EFB 4.5 was a major, major release in that it did a lot to do with weather. It's the one that added the timeline at the bottom, the altitude slider at the top, really, really totally game changed uh, the way that people take a look at doing either pre-flight planning or flying with weather in the cockpit. It really was a massive release and people absolutely loved it. What's fascinating is when I took a look at the slides, I found that the very first slide, the one I'm showing you right now, is, other than the graphic, identical. That is, our objective in FlyQ EFB 5.0 was the same, really, as, as 4.5, just from a different perspective. Specifically, we want to really help people fly safer by improving pre-flight planning. You can now look at weather um, from this vertical slice profile, like you see on the screen here. You can see how weather is going to change during your flight at different time periods and so on. Very, very good for a pre-flight planning perspective. Similarly, again, just like in 4.5, we wanted to really improve the safety and the ability to avoid weather and such while you're in in-flight mode. So again, like 4.5, the system, and I think this is on the next slide, on this next piece here, the slide, uh, the, the uh, 5.0 product works a little bit differently whether you're flying in the plane, which is what we call flight mode, versus when you're just sitting at your desk or sitting in a hangar or in your car and you're doing pre-flight planning. Because if you think about it, what you want to see on the screen is going to be noticeably different, whether you're actually navigating and executing a flight or if you're sitting there comfortably just trying to plan when and if you're going to fly. The other point, which is point number three in this slide, is that also like in 4.5, the weather that you see with about one exception or so, the weather that, that you see on the profile view today from this presentation is available either through the internet, like what I'm using right now, or also available when you're flying with an ADS-B receiver in your plane. So we really try to make it totally seamless to you, or at least as seamless as possible, uh, so that you won't really necessarily even know if you're uh, flying in the plane in terms of looking at the weather, or if you're on the ground, you're going to see the same kind of weather on the cockpit in both cases. And again, it's going to work very differently in terms of how it works when you're flying or not. So let's take a look at these specific features that you get. So the profile view has, I'm gonna back this up a little bit. So if you take a look at the profile view um, itself, the, you know, the colorful chunk in the middle of the screen, in the upper right corner, there's a stack of papers icon. If you take a look at the lower left corner, there's another stack of papers icon. On the lower left one, that's the one to do with the map. So if you're using the product all right today, you know that you hit the stack of papers icon to change the layers on the 2D map. Similarly, if you hit the stack of papers icon in the upper right side of the profile view, you also change the layers that you see there. Same, same, okay? Hit the layers button and you change layers. So let's go back to here. So let's talk about the specific features, the specific layers on the map. First of all, there are seven different layers that have very specifically to do with weather. They are ceilings. So we'll show you if the cloud layer that's above you is scattered, if it's overcast, if it's uh, broken, that kind of thing. We'll also show you the cloud tops. If those are from the internet, cloud tops are cumulus cloud tops. If they're from ADSB, and this is one of those small differences in ADSB versus internet. If they're ADSB, they're all cloud tops, even if they're not cumulus. You see winds aloft, and there's a lot of time they'll spend on winds aloft today because it's a particularly useful feature, I think, as you can imagine when you're flying in a plane, to really have a sense of, can I get there faster by flying at a different altitude, and uh, that kind of thing. In FlyQ 4.5, we introduced several new uh, weather layers. Two of the key ones were icing and turbulence, and we carried that forward here to FlyQ version 5, in that the icing layers uh, and the turbulence layers are now also available either through the internet or through ADSB when using FlyQ 5.0 in the profile view. Similarly, you have features like airmets and sigmets, and those are now available on the profile view as well, and in a slightly different way, because it's not actually listed as a layer. I'll explain why later. Um, but the METARs and TAFs that you see along your route are also now on the profile view. Besides weather, we have four other layers that you can put on the screen. Those would be things like a magenta flight plan line, so when you think about your 2D map, you know that there's a magenta line showing you where you're flying. If you're familiar with FlyQ 
there's magenta line representing the portion of your flight on the timeline, which is when you're actually flying. And now there's another, a third magenta line, which is on the new profile view, also representing your flight plan. One of the other features that we take from the 2D map is something called TAWS. TAWS is Terrain Awareness Warning System. Basically, it colorizes terrain uh, based on your altitude so that if the train is near you, but you're still uh, safe of it, it'll be yellow. If on the other hand, the train is very close to you or you're actually below the level of the train, it's colored bright red, so you can't miss it. Another layer that we have is airspaces and airways. And this is a key point too, and again, you'll see this during the demo, but there are different ways to synchronize the way, these are the sections marked options towards the, the graphic on the left-hand side. The sync options are, so you can either synchronize what the weather that you see based on your flight plan. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you have a six hour flight plan from A to B. When the, the way that the layers are set up on the profile, the way that the profile view is set up, the right hand side of the profile view is always where you land and where you begin is on the left side. Well, I probably should have said that the other way around. You begin at the left and you go to the right, just the way that you read in English. So no matter the, the actual direction of whichever way your flight is going, the beginning to your flight is on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you have the ending. Now, I said it was a six-hour flight. So you can imagine that the weather that you're going to see at takeoff time, which is on the left side, versus landing time, which is on the right side, is likely to be quite different and at various points in the middle be different. When you synchronize with a flight plan, what that means is that, that the weather that you see on the profile view is based on the weather that is expected at each point during your flight. So the weather that you see on the left-hand side, the beginning of the flight, is based on takeoff time. And the weather that you see on the right-hand side, which is landing time, is based on six hours from now on a six hour flight. So you get a really good sense of how the weather is going to change during your flight. But you can turn that off. If you want, you can say, I want to just select a time period on the timeline and show me what the weather is going to look like for the entire flight at X time. The other way that you synchronize, and you'll see this during the presentation too, is with map movements. So if you were move and zoom the map, what we do is we try to synchronize the profile view with it. So if you zoom in really tight on the 2D map to uh, like two or three waypoints along your flight, we'll zoom in the profile view to those same set of waypoints. So it automatically shows you what's probably most relevant to you depending on the way you set up the map. Okay, enough talking. Let's actually go to the demo and you can see what I really mean. So essentially what we're doing is when you take a look at the profile view, uh, there's some numbers on the left-hand side. The numbers on the left-hand side, as you can imagine, are the altitudes involved. Now, you may also ask, well, how are these altitudes computed? Basically, what we do is we take a look at the altitude you're actually flying at, if there's no flight plan, or if there is a flight plan, we take a look at your highest cruise altitude, and we scale the altitude on the left-hand side to match a little bit more than what your current flight would be. So that's how that happens. There's another scale, though, running along the bottom. In fact, two scales at the bottom of the screen. The one, one scale that says NM means nautical miles, and you see zero then 197, then 393, and then 590, and so on. Those are nautical miles from the beginning of the flight to looks like 787 nautical miles at the end of the flight. So that gives you a sense of where you are in terms of distance of the flight. And then to make things a little easier to follow than just straight numbers, we have another set, of, we have a set of idents below there that begins with KCAE, uh, MCKEN, and so on, all the way to the left, to the right-hand side, we see L52, which happens to be the airport that we're landing in. You also may notice that the colors on there, and this is what I talked about with METARs and TAFs, why it's not actually a map layer, it's displayed a little bit differently. In this case, you notice that KSEA is yellow, and a couple of the ones along the middle are like Eugene, EUG, or green, KMFR is green, and so on. The reason for that is because we colorize these exactly the same way as we do on the 2D map. In fact, you can kind of see that. Um, that if you take a look at the 2D map, let's see, let me just make sure. So we are flying here from, oh, from Seattle, right, okay. So if you take a look at Seattle, on, I just inadvertently showed you another feature, so I'm gonna change that a little bit, cheat a little bit. But if you take a look at our takeoff point, our takeoff point Seattle um, is in the middle of a number of dots which are yellow. That is why, KSEA on the profile view is also yellow. That means marginal VFR. So in FlyQ parlance, and you can tell us by looking a little at the 2D map, 
almost always in fly queue, other than maybe radar, green is good, red is bad, and yellow or orange are somewhere in the middle. So if you look at the 2D map, you can see that there's um, a point that's red towards the middle of the screen. That means it has IFR or, M or low IFR conditions. The yellows are marginal VFR, those dots, and then uh, all of the dots that are green are VFR conditions. That same color coding is used mi to mirror on, if you could hang on for just one second, hang on. You know, it's a funny thing when you're doing present, when you're doing work from home these days, you often hear dogs in the background or kids or something like that. I uh, happen to be in the office today. And of course, the cleaning people come in and turn on the vacuum cleaner. So you can't win them all. Anyway, uh, the point here is that the color coding that you see on those idents on the screen have to do with what the, the weather the conditions are going to be like as you pass them. And that's important to understand. Okay, so let's talk about moving um, the profile view too. So the, the profile view is really mirrored a lot in the way that the timeline works. It's a lot of the same gestures and mechanisms. So most of the things I show you in terms of moving and panning um, on the profile view are exactly the same way that you can do it on the timeline. For example, let's say that I was looking at my profile view and I see KMFR towards the middle of the screen in green, and it looks like a landing, looks like I'm getting fuel there. If I wanted to zoom in on that, I take two fingers and I stretch them out, just like you would on you know, any kind of an iPad app. And that's how you zoom in. Pretty quick, pretty simple. You see the map down below changes too, so there's some side effect there. But as you, the point is that as you move in, you can see more details. I mean, if you want to, you can also take those same two fingers and move them left and right. So I can move it this way, I can move it back the other way, and so on. So you can move it, you can pan it, you can zoom it, and also just like on the profile view, if you've moved it and zoomed it and you want to just get back to seeing the full thing, anywhere in the profile view, you can double tap, just like that. And it goes, it snaps back to the standard. I'll explain what some of the symbols are in a second on the profile view, but I just want to uh, want you to understand how it works. One of the other things that the system can do is, we talked a little bit about synchronizing the weather that you see to the, to the timeline um, and that you see in your flight plan, but it can also synchronize what you see on the map with the profile view, for example. Let's say that I move my, my map to this point right here. So I'm zoomed into SNS. Look what just happened. The profile view updated itself as well. So the, in fact, I'm gonna, just for a second, just so you can see this, I'm gonna turn off the winds aloft layer. Okay, so you can see that SNS is now zoomed in here. And as I move the map to different points, this can also change. See that? So for example, in the middle of the screen is SFO, and then above that is Rebos, and below SFO is OSI. So if you take a look at the profile view, you see those same points. You see Rebus, SFO, OSI, and a couple more uh, to the left and right. If I were to zoom in really, really tight to say SFO, the profile view snaps to showing you whatever's on the screen, like for example, SFO, plus what ident before it and what ident after it. That's why you see SFO in the middle, and then before it comes Rebos on the left, and after SFO comes OSI on the right. Make sense? So as you change the zoom and you pull in more ident points on here, you see more idents appear on the profile view as well. And as you move it, you get the same sort of effect. Okay, makes sense? Now, uh, let's talk about other things that you can do. Let's say I'm gonna double tap on the screen to reset to normal, and I'm going to turn back on, um, I'll explain this in a little bit, but I'll turn the winds layer back on. And let's say that I'm looking at something and I'm like, hmm, that looks like it might be an issue. Let's see what that is. So for example, if you, again, looking at Eugene, the EUG uh, in green ident on the profile view towards the left side below the 197, if I take my finger and just scroll it over it, I'm not moving the profile view. What I'm doing is I'm selecting kind of a vertical slice to see more details on. So if I stop my finger, or you can just do this by tapping, by the way, too. If I stop my finger here over Eugene and release, I see much more details about this. So take a look at the details that you see. Of course, you get the latitude, longitude, and so on, and you get the train elevation. 
One thing is you do see clearance negative 185 in bright red. What does that mean? That means that currently, if you take a look at the upper left corner where it says altitude feet, upper left corner of the whole screen, you see altitude feet, ground speed, track, waypoint, all that stuff. You notice that I'm currently at about 171 feet. So what it's telling me is that the elevation in Eugene is 355 feet. And since I'm only at 177, I, my clearance is bad. I have negative clearance, which means I'd be below ground. And that's why it's red at 185. And when you're in flight, this probably makes a little more sense. The other thing that the system does is that details has a scrollable area like this, and it shows you bits of information depending on the layers that are selected. So right now I've selected my ceilings. The ceilings are the white dot, dot uh, the white lines. So for example, again, remember we're looking and there's a little pointer above where it says profile detail. There's a little black pointer showing you exactly where you tapped. So what this is telling me is that if you take a look on the profile view and you look up, you see uh, a couple of white dots at about 2,000 feet, kind of the, the second blue line. And then a little bit above that, one blue line above it, you see dashes, so you see dots and dashes. So what this is telling me on the details is it explains a little bit more clearly. It's telling me that in terms of ceilings, beginning at the bottom there at 1500 AGL, I have scattered. Dots mean scattered, dashes mean broken, and a solid white bar means that it is overcast. For example, so for example, if I tap off this and select over here, I'm going to see an overcast, a broken, and two scattered layers. Okay. Now the other thing that you see here too is on Winds Aloft. Again, we really like to use colors in FlyQ. So what we did is a couple of different things. So what we're showing you here is that for Winds Aloft, uh, we're colorizing it in two different ways. We're saying that as you take a look at, say, the 6,000 point line, that the winds are coming from 229 at 30 knots. We're calling that green because it's relatively light. But then we're computing based on your direction of flight. That means that you're going to get a headwind. Now, the headwind is eight knots. And if you go up to 9,000 feet, the headwind is one knot. But we're keeping this really simple. All headwinds are red. All tailwinds are green. So as you get up to, let's say, towards the bottom of the screen, at say 39,000 feet, which I know all of us in the 172 fly at. But if you were at 39,000 feet, you'd have a tailwind in green of 23 knots. And of course we have the temperatures on the side. So we use a lot of different color coding. The, at that same 39,000 feet, you see that the winds are from oh, 259 and at 90 knots, 90 knots is colorized as being fairly strong and therefore is orange. Okay, so lots of colors on the screen. Also, and again, I, at, at this point, I tapped a little bit over uh, the point over MFR, kind of near there. Uh, it looks like closer maybe to RGB. So this is giving me the TAF, easy to read. And the reason why it's showing me the TAF, not the METAR, you may wonder, well, why is it doing that? It does that because the point that I tapped in the map, which is, again, just to kind of clarify this. So the point in the map that I tapped on was about here, where the green bar is. So at that point, you're about 250 miles, let's say, into the flight. So when you release it, it's you know, telling me that, so you know, do a little bit of quick math, and you see if you're flying at about 120 knots, it's gonna take you about two hours to get there, um, plus the winds, but at minimum two hours. That's why it's showing me a TAF, because it knows that the weather, pro the METAR weather product, two hours from now isn't valid. But it does know that there's a TAF from uh, KRBG, which is valid for that time period, and that's why it's showing me the TAF. So for example, if we were to, I'm gonna just select now an area towards Seattle, towards the beginning of the flight, and my guess, right, is that we see a METAR here, because now we're very close to current time. This METAR was updated at 3.53, which looking at my watch is about 20 minutes ago or so, 25 minutes ago. So this METAR is still valid. And you get the METAR. I think you also get the TAF too. Yeah. So you can see the TAF if you want to look forward. But if the METAR is out of scope, which is to say it's too far in the past, you won't see the METAR at all. Okay. So let's talk now about just other little things on here. That's how the detail screen works. If you turn on all the layers, by the way, you see more details. So the amount of detail that you see in the details view is depending upon which layers you've selected. 
So I'll talk a little bit about some of the details uh, on there in a second. But the other things that you can do is, if you decide, for example, that you don't want to see the profile view, there's an X in the upper left corner of it. Just tap on that X and it goes away. If you want to bring it back, it's, it's think of it as a layer. So what you do is on the 2D map, you tap the layer stack of paper icon on the left-hand side. And then, so this is where in 4.5, we had all the base layers, the weather layers, the safety, and we added on the far right side towards the bottom uh, tool section. So you see the timeline is blue, the altitude is blue because the timeline and the altitude slider are on. Uh, the legend control is there, but you notice that the profile, the very last item on the right side is off, okay? Therefore, to turn it, to turn the profile back on, you just tap on the word profile and boom, there you go. So easy to do. Other things, to, so let's talk again a little bit about the way that uh, the weather works and I'll get into some of the details on this. So when you, tack the, when you tap the stack of papers icon, there's a bunch of layers at the top, but then there's two items at the bottom. One that says sync uh, flight time and one that says sync with zoom. So I'm gonna turn, so remember when sync uh, flight, flight time is on, it means that the weather at the, the left-hand side is based on your takeoff, the weather that's on the right-hand side is based on landing, and everything in the middle is calibrated appropriately. Now, that can be kind of handy, because take a look at this. If you take a look at the um, uh, timeline, if you move the timeline, look what happens. In fact, I'm gonna just do this. Let me just change the map so you can see what's happening here. So as you move yourself in the timeline in the magenta area, you see yourself being tracked on both the profile view and on the 2D view, just like that. Of course, if you get, so right now, you see an icon for the aircraft representing your current position at about 10 p.m. tonight on the profile view and on the 2D map and so on. If you were to move it off the edge, either too far into the future, like 1 a.m., or too far in the past, like at 3.30 p.m., you don't see an icon on the map or the profile view because where would you put it? Doesn't really make any sense. But notice that the weather doesn't change no matter what time I select. You may think, oh, that's a bug, that's a bug. It's not a bug. The reason is because in this case, we've told the system to synchronize to the flight plan. So the weather that you see on the profile view has to do with, again, when you're gonna pass each point in the flight. But you can change that. If you tap the stack of papers icon on the profile view in the upper right corner, and you go down to the bottom where it says options, the first one there is sync flight time. If I deselect sync flight time, things will change. Basically, the weather that you begin to see is going to change based on that. Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to turn on the icing layer and move it to roughly the current time. Now you see all of that icing along the way. So it's showing you what the, uh, that's all the blue and white stuff at the, towards the top of the screen. So if I, for example, were to select near EMAID um, a little bit before the 197 mark, if I tap over here, I see my broken clouds, my winds, but I also see icing probabilities and using the same colors as what you see in the profile view. So you know that at 9,000 feet, you have a 26% probability. It's about double that at 7,000 feet a little more at 5,000, uh, but if you're below that, if you're below 3,000 feet, no icing at all, okay? So you get more details uh, because I've selected more layers, but that's based on the current time. If I were to go to here and select sync flight time, you're gonna notice that most of the icing goes away. In fact, now you see a hash, so it's an interesting thing. If you look very closely at the screen, um, on the far left side of the profile view, near KSEA and MCKEN, you notice there's a little tiny bit of blue. I'm gonna just highlight that over here. So it's like this area right here. You see a little bit of the blue stuff telling you that there is in fact icing. However, you see this uh, ver to see the diagonal blue lines on the rest of it. That means that there is no data for it because the uh, icing that we get from the internet is not a predictive product, it's an actual product. So it doesn't really show you what's gonna happen in the future. By the way, if all of these colors and symbols start to get really confusing, most of them are listed on, it, it uses the same colors that's on the 2D view. So on the 2D side, if you hit the layers button and you look at that same tools area, which we popped up the profile view, which is on the far uh, right side towards the bottom, there's an item here called legend. This existed since FlyQ 4.5, and it shows you what those colors and symbols mean. 
So you see icing potential using shades of blue. Icing, it's a little bit different with ADSB than what you get through the internet. Turbulence, it shows you what those colors are like. So a kind of light greens and light blues are light or very light. As you get to icing that's more severe, it becomes darker and darker red and so on. Winds aloft, you get the coloring on here. So you know that a light wind is zero to 20, a stronger wind is 21 to 60, an orange, and then the red ones are 61 plus. So same colors, has a uh, VFR colors and so on. So again, you can get to that at any time and the same colors are used on the profile view. So again, you hit the layer stack uh, on the 2D view and you hit the legend button and boom, it goes. And now you're done. So the point here is that if you take a look at the legend, you see that for icing, we have a concept of no data, which are blue diagonal lines. So the reason why we're using the blue diagonal lines here is to say, yes, we have some inference. Well, in this case, we simply have no idea if there's icing there or not. If we were to just display nothing there, that could very well lead you to the wrong conclusion that there is, in fact, no icing. But as you know from doing the syncing option, in all likelihood, there is probably icing there. But since it's in the future and we don't have a predictive product, we really can't tell for sure. So we really have no data for it. That's why syncing to flight plan and looking ahead a little in the future will give you the diagonal bars. Does that make sense? It's a little bit confusing, I realize, but it, it's to give you the sense of something's wrong here. So let's talk a little bit. I'm going to turn off the syncing because it's a little easier to show on the demo. Something else that you may have noticed when let's begin going through the layers, I think is probably a good idea to do now. So the flight plan line is that magenta line. You can turn that on or off just like that. The train avoidance isn't really obvious. Uh, when you're in pre-flight mode because we intentionally don't bother to color all the terrain red just because you're sitting at sea level not moving. That's kind of silly. So the TAS layer is only effective when you're actually flying or you're using the simulator. You can turn. I'm going to turn off the icing to make some of these things a little easier. I'm going to turn on airspace. So when the airspace layer is turned on, there you go. You see some bright blue marks, some bl bright blue areas like Seattle. The reason why it's blue is because on a sectional map, we use, this, we use the same colors in the profile view as you do on the sectional. So blue means it's controlled airspace class B. The magenta, like near BTG, which is near the Portland area, uh, that is a class C airspace. So it's magenta. Uh, it looks like around Rebus, you have another class B airspace and so on. So that's where those colors come from on airspaces. The ceiling layer, again, are those white bars. Solid means that it's overcast. Uh, dashed means that it's broken. And dots means that it's scattered. Okay. So let's turn on, I'm going to turn off the airspaces and turn on cloud tops. So the cloud top layer is a really interesting one. The cloud top layer is available um, from either the internet or from an ADSB receiver. And what it does is it creates a series of little blue, blue, blue lines. So if I were to move my cursor over one of those, like I'll select around eMade, there are some dots. So I'm going to select that. And then let's take a look. So it shows me cloud tops at just 2,000 feet. That's why it's a very dark blue on there. Well, if I select something that's maybe a little bit higher, like I'll select one that's oh, this one right here, the cloud top is at 4,000 feet. So it's a little bit different. And then maybe even here, probably 2,000 feet. So the cloud tops that you get are dependent upon where you see the cloud tops on the profile view as well. Like here, it looks like we have 7,000 feet in the cloud top area and so on. Okay. Let's go back to some of the other layers. One of the ones that you've probably been wondering about is those arrows on the screen. So the arrows on the screen are winds aloft. Now, you may wonder, well, why don't you show me a little bit more detail? The reason is because if you zoom in a lot on it to give you how strong they are, it gets a little messy. So at this zoom level, we can kind of tell you how strong the wind is. But at kind of the zoomed out level, I just double tapped the profile view, by the way. At this zoomed out level, there's not enough space to tell you precisely how strong the wind is. So we do two things. We colorize it, where again, the standard colors are used. So green means that it's a light wind under 20 knots and orange, is from 20 to 60, and then any reds, which I don't see, are greater than 60. 
but they're arrows and they're pointing in a specific direction. They're either pointing to the left or they're pointing to the right. What does that mean? Let's take a look. So I'm going to select these orange folks over here that are pointing to the left. And if you take a look, you see that at all altitudes, red, headwind 24, headwind 22, headwind 26. So that's why, because it's telling you that there is a headwind. So the arrow is going against you, because remember, the concept is that you're flying from the left side of the screen to the right side. Well, on the other hand, if I were to tap over here, I get green bars and hey, happy days. We have tailwinds. So on, at that particular point, with the arrow going to the right, that means that the wind is going with us, we're picking up a tailwind, and then the green just gives you a sense of what the intensity is. So that's what the direction means. There's a directionality built into it, and there's a coloration system to give you details. If you wanted to know more, for example, if you wanted to zoom into this area, you just pinch and zoom, and now you start to see a lot more uh, that looks like about maximum zoom level right now. So you know that the winds, uh, the to by the way, the number in, in the parenthesis, the number in the circle is the total velocity, not the amount of headwind or tailwind. It's the total velocity. So that's the way that the wind system works. Again, I'm going to double tap just to go back to kind of the uh, smaller view of the winds. And let's keep going through the, the layers. Icing, we've talked about, I think, a decent amount. So the icing again uses color a, a color system where white means light essentially, and the darker blue, the worse it is. So if I were to select, uh, say, this area on the map, I should see a couple of different layers of icing. Yeah. So you notice that in the at 9,000 feet, I have a 66 prob percent probability of ice, but it's just a little bit lower than that, 7,000 feet. I'm at 76 percent probability. I would also point out that icing is a little bit different whether it's from the internet or if it's from ADSB, in particular, and let's go to the legend. Uh, so I hit the 2D button and hit the legend. The icing, icing from the internet is icing potential. So that's what you're seeing. So a percentage, how likely is some kind of icing? When it's from ADSB, it's a little bit different. Um, there are colors to tell you the intensity of the icing. So if you see, say, kind of a, a dark blue, but not purple, you get moderate uh, icing is what you're likely to find here. While if you take a look at the potential, it, that same color represents something like maybe 60% probability of icing, but you don't have any idea about how severe it is. So there's a little bit of a difference in the data. Not a lot, a little bit. Let's go back to the layers again. Let's deselect icing. I'm going to turn on turbulence. You can turn them on at the same time, so, but um, which is pretty. You can do that and you get a lot of colors on the screen. So, well, let's try that. So let's say that I select an area uh, around here, around Rebass. You notice that there's icing around there, and it looks like there's some yellow stuff. So let's see what that means in the details. Not surprisingly, you have a lot of cloud ceilings, and it means that you have an icing uh, at 9,000 feet, about a 50% probability, give or take. And for turbulence, it looks like uh, no turbulence above 1,000 feet, uh, but at 1,000 feet, you're getting yellow or light turbulence. And then, of course, you can read more details if you want to from the METAR or the TAF uh, that you get over here. Okay. So all of these layers can be mixed and mixed and matched. Also notice, by the way, that at the far right-hand side of the profile view, L52 is now red. Uh, this just shows that we really do have all the colors on here. That means that the weather conditions right now, because I believe I turned on, yeah, I turned off sync flight time. So it's using the timeline, which is about 4.30 or so. So it's saying at 4.30, L52 is showing IFR conditions. That's why it's red. Other things, let's put on some airways. So we'll turn on the airway layer here. And you see a few different things that are uh, pretty useful. So let's take a look at the area on towards the left-hand side. So again, I'm going to scrub the line here and look over Battleground, release that, and you see that there are two different airways which are in that vicinity. You see Victor 287 has an MEA, minimum on run altitude, of 6,000, and Victor 23 has the same. Now, as you may know, certain Victors, I'm not sure about these two, sometimes two different Victors are actually the same airway. Other times they're just very close to each other. One of the things that's really important to know about the safety of the product is 
when we display the profile view and we show terrain and all that good stuff and we show an airway or we show weather we're not actually just picking a discrete point in space that's like one inch wide by you know, one inch tall what we're actually doing is we're looking at the point that you select in a slightly wider area like on the order of about half a nautical mile so when we show you the terrain for example if if you see terrain that is let's say that you were flying through a valley if you are flying through a valley and it's relatively low where you are, but you have high mountains fairly close to you on either side, you may see this weird situation where the profile view is telling you that you are actually flying below the ground level. And it's doing that because it's pessimistic. What it tries to do is it tries to show you the worst possible terrain that is fairly close to you to give you a sense of, well, you don't want the situation where it looks like you're totally clear, but if you move three feet to one way, you're gonna hit something. So what we try to do is to be a little pessimistic about it. That same system is used for the Victor Airways. So we take a look at all the Victor Airways that are close to where you are, and we give you the data on that. So let's turn that off. And AirMets and SigMets are also available. Turn icing, turbulence, whatever it may be. And let's tap over here and see what you get. Well, that's a lot of different ceilings, a lot of icing, a lot of turbulence. And now we have all those AirMets. So you know that, hey, what a surprise. Turbulence is expected um, between these times of day. Looks like between 18,000 feet and 41,000. So it looks like the turbulence here that we see, there's a little bit of light turbulence at 1,000. It's not showing us the expected turbulence at its 18,000 feet because we it system knows that your flight isn't anywhere near that altitude. So it's capping the profile view off at about 8,000 feet. Otherwise, you would see the same thing there. By the way, you can tap it and you can see more details, just like you can on the 2D map. So if you want to know more details about the mountain obscuration, there you go, tap it. And you can tap it again and see it full size. Kind of cool, huh? You can do that on the 2D map as well, exactly the same feature. Let's keep going through the layers. Well, that's about it on the layers. So now what I want to do is I want to show you what it's like. This has been in pre-flight mode. So now I'm going to pretend that we're actually executing a flight. Uh, first, let me turn off some of the layers. Turn off the AirMet segments, for example. Okay. FlyQ EFB has a simulator built into it. So you can obviously drive it using X-Plane or using uh, older versions of Microsoft Flight Sim or Prepare 3D, uh, but you can also, or Prepare, however it's pronounced, but there's a simulator built into the system. It, at the upper right corner of the screen, you see five little icons. The first two are green. It says GPS and weather, and then there's three, uh, let's call them black ones. Those are your status indicators. They give you immediate information about, is my GPS green? Good. Is my weather green? Good. Um, and so on. If either one of those turn red, it would mean that like you lost your GPS or your weather is very old for some reason. But if you tap any of those five anywhere on there, you have then a subcategory and you can select a GPS. You can see the status of all of your weather products. You can, if you're connected to ADSB, it gives you lots of information about ADSB and it tells you about your flight recording. But in this case, I really just care about the GPS because I want to turn on the simulator. So there's a switch on the right-hand side that says simulator. Just turn it on and take a look at what you get. So now our flight is on the screen here. Notice, by the way, the profile view turned off because by default, during flight mode, we don't show you the profile view because it could be annoying a lot of the time. But I'm gonna turn it on anyway. So I'm gonna manually turn on the profile view and now you see what we're getting. So now it's using, if I sync this to my flight time, now it's showing me what the weather is expected to be like uh, all the way through my flight from Seattle to, uh, to uh, L52. And if I pull up the timeline, I can see that still just like it could before on here. By the way, I'll show you something you may not have known. If you zoom this out, notice that on the 2D map, there's suddenly two airplanes. Well, that looks a little weird, doesn't it? Why do you see two airplanes? You see two airplanes because one is your actual position and the ghost of the airplane on the 2D map is where you are expected to be at the time you're pointing to on the flight plan line. See, it moves as I move there. And then when you release, you'll find in about five seconds, 10 seconds, that the ghost image is gonna go away and everything will, and the timeline will actually go away, I believe as well. And there you go, just like that. So the same system is used on the profile view. It's conceptually very similar. 
but I'm doing this because I want to turn on a couple of things. Let's turn on TAWS. And I'm going to turn off the icing and the turbulence, leave winds and ceiling on, sorry, winds and ceiling on. So now, you can see that some of the um, terrain is red, which makes a lot of sense because if you look at the upper left-hand corner, my altitude, and we're rising right now, um, is about 3,400 feet. But 3,400 feet is way below, and I'll, I'll take a look around uh, MFR. If you take a look there, you see that the actual elevation there is 7,300 feet, elevation 7,290. And that implies that we're about 3,700 feet too low. So it would be a really, really bad idea obviously to fly at that altitude but notice that that will change over time for example one of the other things that you can do in the simulator is you can turn up the speed of the simulation so i'm going to set this to warp factor 10 and you'll actually be able to see that um notice how the colors are changing right now uh, it looks like candy corns above mfr and zunas that's because we're going up so the reds and the yellows are disappearing and now they've totally disappeared just like that Okay, so that's the way that the train view works on there. So you can see TAWS in action. Notice it also says at the top, it says from flight plan. What that's telling you is that the weather is being generated again because of where your flight plan is. If you didn't have a flight plan loaded or if you stray too far um, from your flight plan, specifically if you have a cross track error of more than uh, 0.5 nautical miles. We assume that you are not flying on the flight plan. And what we do instead is we show you about 100 miles looking ahead in a straight line direction based on your track. But since the built-in simulator in flight, you can't really do anything other than perfectly follow the flight plan. It, you never see a cross track error. I can show you though what it looks like in kind of a, a, a little cheating sort of way. So let me do this. I'm going to go to my flight plan. You may not know that the product could do this. When you're taking a look at the nav log, um, there's a series of buttons like uh, the A button to make the font size bigger, wind optimizer to show you what fuel burns are like at different altitudes and let you select them, a reverse the flight plan, and then a button called clear. Clear basically does just what you'd say. It removes the current flight plan. So poof, no more flight plan. So if I go back to my map, it's now showing you, instead of saying uh, at the top of the profile view, it doesn't say flight plan, it says direction of flight. And it's simply telling me looking ahead, um, it looks like 100 miles, it's showing you what the train looks like. So it kind of operates in two different modes. That's what you're going to see if you're flying and you're not directly on your flight plan line, it'll show you a display uh, more like that. And of course, that can still include cloud tops, icing and turbulence and all of that. Um, just to give you uh, the same air, the same things, can, the same layers are applicable. It just means that it uses looking straight ahead as opposed to following the, the flight plan line itself. One other thing I should point out too is that you can split the screen. So if you want to set up one side of the screen different, so for example, you want to zoom in on one side, and you want maybe even something like a 3D view on the other side of the screen, whatever you want to do, you can configure this separately. You can even, if you're looking at the, um, at two different maps, you can, if you wanted to, display the profile twice, and you could, uh, I'm gonna actually load a flight plan now. Let me load the flight plan back just so you get a sense, again, of what it does. All right, so the flight plan's loaded, you go back to the map. So you could, if you wanted to, you could even do things like, you can have one profile view is a lot more zoomed in than the other profile view, whatever you wanna do. So you have a lot of flexibility, and again, since it's FlyQ, you can also turn the screen around and you can get them uh, looking a little different. You can turn off maybe the top one and so on, rotate it back around, and there you go. Okay, So there's a lot of flexibility in the way that you can do this. Um, and that, I hope, gives you a good sense of what you can do with FlyQ EFB 5.0. It's very conceptually similar to the weather features we added in 4.5, just taken from a side view as opposed to a top-down view like you have in uh, 4.5. So again, what we really tried to focus on here is to keep you safe in terms of avoiding terrain and keep you safe in terms of avoiding bad weather. And this is Steve Podrachik and Sean and John Rutter all helping here today. And we really like to thank you for spending some of your evening with us.